So my name is Paul Holden. I'm the President and CEO of the Burnley Board of Trade and uh, welcome to this afternoon's event. As many of you know, this is Chamber of Commerce Week uh, and as part of our programming, of which there's quite a lot uh, going on this week, we're very pleased today to be joined by Minister Ravi Callum, uh, the Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery uh, and Innovation. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be serving on his task force for uh, uh, COVID recovery and resilience uh, with, um, with the many other uh, leaders of business organisations across the province. Um, this event, as we mentioned earlier, is being held as a Zoom webinar. So while attendees are not automatically on camera, uh, we do encourage you to share your thoughts uh, and questions in the chat box. Uh, just a reminder to everybody that the session today is being recorded and will be shared with our members who were not able to join the session. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that this event, this event is being held, well, at least where I'm sitting, is being held on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the tsleil Musqueam and Squamish nations. Um, today's event and the work of the Burnley Board of Trade just wouldn't be possible without the support of our amazing roster of sponsors. And today's event is, is presented and supported by the Port of Vancouver. Uh, the, port of, uh, the Port is Canada's largest and most diversified uh, port and the port's activities support over 115,000 jobs and enables the trade of approximately $240 billion in goods to and from Canada. Uh, the port is an integral part of our economy and a key partner of the Burnley Board of Trade and we're very grateful for their support with the event today. Um, at this point, I'd also like to acknowledge our annual partners. Uh, we have a great roster of organizations who support the work that we do throughout the year. And um, the annual partners are the, at the platinum level, the Burnaby Now and the BCIT School of Business and Media. Uh, the gold level, SFU, Pacific Blue Cross, Douglas College, Fortis BC, Electronic Arts and ABC Recycling. And at the silver level, we have Scotiabank, Trans Mountain, Appia Development, Alexander College, Port of Vancouver and the TD Bank Group. So now I'd like to invite Jocelyn Young, who's the Manager of External Relations from today's partner, the Port of Vancouver, who will be saying a few words on their behalf. Jocelyn. Thank you, Paul. Can you hear me all right? Yep, we can. Perfect. Minister Callan, on behalf of the Burnaby Board of Trade and the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, we thank you for taking the time to be with us today and for sharing your perspective on what is needed for economic recovery for our business community. The Port of Vancouver is, as Paul said, Canada's largest port and port-related activity supports 115,000 jobs across the country, 96,000 of which are here in BC. The port is also critical to many more jobs and industries across Canada that depend on it for their importing and exporting needs so that they can build thriving businesses. Trade through the port has been growing steadily for the past decade, in part because the port is very resilient. This resiliency is due to a couple of factors. The first is the diversity of the cargo handled by port terminals, and the second is the access that the port provides to more than 170 countries around the globe, keeping Canadians and Canadian businesses connected to essential goods and international markets. We've seen the benefit of the port's resilience in tough economic times. We saw it during the recession of 2008, 2009, after which trade bounced back strongly. And we're seeing it again now throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. The port's continuing strong performance is enabling the Port Authority to move forward despite the pandemic with major infrastructure projects. These projects support trade capacity and an efficient supply chain across the Lower Mainland, which means increased and improved goods movement into and from the Port of Vancouver. These projects are directly supporting our regional economic recovery by supporting jobs and by helping sustain the local companies we contract with while also injecting investment dollars into our region at this challenging time. I'm grateful for the strong partnerships between the Port Authority and our partners, both government and industry, and I look forward to continuing to work together to keep both Canada and BC strong and competitive. Thank you so much and back to you, Paul. Thank you, Justin, and thanks very much to the Port of Vancouver for their support, and not just of today's event, um, but also of, of the work that we do throughout the year. Uh, very much appreciated. Now I'd like to introduce our guest today, the Honourable Ravi Callum, uh, Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. Minister Callan is, is the MLA for Delta North and has previously served as the Parliamentary Secretary for Forests, Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, and as Parliamentary Secretary 
for sport and multiculturalism. Born and raised in Victoria, Mr. Callum was introduced to field hockey by his father and grandfather, and later went on to be a two-time Olympian in the sport for Team Canada, and has been inducted into the Delta Sports Hall of Fame. Before he was elected as MLA, uh, Ravi worked in banking and served for years in his community, and we're pleased to have him here today. Minister, could I head over to you to say a few uh, opening remarks uh, before we have our discussion? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, and uh, good afternoon to everyone that's uh, tuning in. We were talking about in the uh, green room how this uh, new normal is uh, takes some time getting used to, but uh, I appreciate uh, uh, you inviting me today to to speak to your members. Um, I'd like to also extend greetings from uh, Premier John Horgan. Uh, and I want to recognize some of my colleagues who uh, are viewing right now. I know Minister Chen and Minister Kang um, and uh, MLA's, uh, um, um, MLA Chohan and, uh, and Rutledge as well are probably going to be logging in and uh, want to acknowledge their uh, loud voice that they have for members, but they carry a lot of weight within our, in our room and appreciate their contribution. Uh, Paul, I also want to acknowledge that I'm uh, speaking to you on the traditional territory of the Coast Village people, the Sawasan and the Muslim Nation. And, uh, uh, and I want to thank you, Paul, actually, for your, your leadership. I know uh, uh, you mentioned briefly that uh, you're part of our super committee, uh, super COVID committee, we call it, which is uh, uh, 60 stakeholder associations across BC that uh, are helping us, giving us advice through uh, the pandemic and appreciate uh, appreciate the work that you're doing there um, on behalf of your members. So since becoming minister, I've made it a priority to engage with business owners and industry associations. Uh, your input has been critically important. I often say that government does not have a monopoly on good ideas and the best programs and policies are created through collaboration. Uh, and I wanna let you know, uh, your members know that we we're listening. Uh, the province is committed to working on an economic recovery plan with you, uh, include industry partners and other levels of government. This certainly applies to the Burnaby Board of Trade as well. Um, as uh, many of your members will know, British Columbia entered this pandemic as an economic leader in Canada. We had low unemployment and very strong job growth. The second wave of the pandemic has been a, a very long struggle, <laughs> but we're making progress. Since the economic low point last April, BC has seen nine consecutive months of job growth. However, there's still significant challenges that remain for sectors where the pandemic continues to interfere with operations, particularly those uh, for the hospitality, the tourism, and the personal services sectors. Some businesses in these sectors won't be able to return to full capacity until we're through this crisis. Uh, and this pandemic has revealed the hardships uh, that are not evenly distributed. Uh, we know people of color, indigenous people, women, uh, young people continue to be more vulnerable to lost hours, lost revenues, and higher, uh, higher unemployment. Uh, there's a, a saying that uh, we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different boats. Some of us are weathering the storm better than others. That's why we're building a more inclusive economy that doesn't leave people behind. So my ministry, the Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation has a very uh, broad mandate. We have a team of dedicated public servants working on programs for small businesses, the tech sector, manufacturing, shipbuilding, aerospace, aviation, and uh, one of my favorite, uh, mass timber. We also co uh, cover export development, strategic investment and trade agreements. The common thread running through all these files is our approach to economic recovery. Our approach to economic recovery is guided by three uh, key pillars, innovation, sustainability, and inclusiveness. Innovation, because this pandemic has accelerated the pace of change and innovation is needed to adapt. Things we expected to happen five to seven years from now are happening right now. The way we work, the way we study, shop, and communicate as we are right now are changing rapidly and forcing businesses to innovate to keep up. We are here to support efforts to innovate and pivot to whatever the new normal will be. Secondly, sustainability, because we cannot ignore climate change. As you know, BC is a world leader in clean, renewable energy. We also are responsible, low carbon producers of natural resources and manufactured goods. We are working to make sustainability a larger part of British Columbia's brand and our global competitive advantage. And thirdly, inclusiveness because we are committed to building an economic recovery that works for everyone. This means improving childcare 
I know Minister Katrina Chen didn't pay me to say that, but I'm just going to say it, uh, so that women can return to work, expanding our workforce. This means taking steps to address reconciliation. We owe it to the people on whose territory that we live and work on to make progress. This means helping underrepresented people gain skills and experience necessary to get good jobs in tech and healthcare and construction. We need Indigenous and Black communities and people of color because we won't reach our true potential if these communities are not part at the table. All of this removes barriers so that talent and skill can rise up and make sure our economy is as productive as possible. Stronger BC, as many of your members will know, is our, one of our kill, uh, pillars of our economic recovery. $1.5 billion of economic recovery created to focus on innovation, sustainability, and inclusiveness. The plan will fortify BC's healthcare system and expand critical public services. It will help thousands of people reskill for jobs and will also provide thousands of businesses with resources to help them adapt and grow. We recently unveiled a new program under Stronger BC called Launch Online. This program provides grants to help businesses build their online sales so they have the opportunity to become more competitive and grow. Stronger BC also includes a small and medium-sized business recovery grant program. This grant helps businesses recover while avoiding taking on more debt. It also includes additional funds for the tourism sector. Lastly, I'll just say COVID-19 has tested us all. Not all businesses and communities are struggling, but those that are struggling need our support. We're prepared to invest in people, invest in businesses to restore economic growth. While there's still so much more work to be done, I'm confident that we'll continue to make progress together. So I'm, I'm so grateful for your partnership, your ongoing commitment to economic development. And uh, with that, Paul, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions from yourself and, uh, and your members. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, much appreciated. And again, thank you for joining us today. And, and thank you for acknowledging your colleagues, uh, your fellow MLAs that are here today. Um, we, we've always enjoyed a fantastic uh, relationship with our four uh, local Burnaby uh, MLAs. And it's great to see them uh, assuming roles of such importance in the government as well. And, and uh, mm -hmm. we, we, um, we, we appreciate all of their support uh, for us as an organisation and for the business community um, that's, uh, that, that's here in the city. Um, I'll just pick up on a couple of things as we start to sort of uh, 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 aggregate some of the questions that we've seen coming through um, and pick up on a couple of things that, that, that you mentioned. Um, you, you mentioned about the speed of change that, that business is, is, is going through with innovation and, and having to do things at a, at a pace that's, that's so much quicker than it used to be. And I guess the same thing could be said for government. And we've seen uh, government uh, rollout programs in a fraction of the time that has happened before. And we've also seen government acknowledge that perhaps in the initial rollout, it wasn't a fully baked solution and it has to revisit it and it welcomes that input to, um, from, from stakeholders to, to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to, to tighten up the program or to improve it in some ways. Um, how have you found that experience and do you see that as perhaps a model for how governments might be operating when it's not in a pandemic situation? Well, uh, there's a few things I'll say, Paul. One, um, there's no playbook for how to handle a pandemic. And so we're making the playbook as we go. Um, and, uh, and we're doing it collaboratively and, and think that's why BC uh, has had success. Um, of course, it's because people have been following the health guidelines and ensuring that they're keeping themselves, their communities and family members safe. That's been critical. Uh, I give a, a big shout out and credit to Premier Horgan for um, taking a, a very thoughtful uh, role in his leadership when it comes to the pandemic. Many premiers across the country have decided that they wanted to be uh, out there in front of the cameras and be the main voices. And, uh, and he took a step back and said, let the science speak. Uh, and that's carried us well to now, and it's gonna carry us well as we start opening uh, so that people know that it's safe to continue to do all the things that we need to do. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say that government has been incredibly innovative um, through this. And, uh, and, and I don't think government gets enough credit. Uh, our bureaucrats who do amazing work sometimes don't get enough credit. Um, the uh, programs that we've rolled out uh, have come out in a rapid pace. Uh, and, uh, and yes, we would love to keep this going forward uh, past pandemic, but it comes at a cost. Uh, some programs are moved really fast, it comes at a cost of other programs. And so um, I, I think that if we look at the way we mobilize entire government to get at all our border crossings in the early days of the pandemic to make sure that people coming home were safe, uh, whether it's 
how we've completely reformed uh, how our court systems operate so that people can have their day in court, um, but we can do it in a safe manner. Uh, I, it's, it's phenomenal to see all these things that are happening. And, uh, and just as I've said to the business community, that rate of change is not going to slow down. Uh, I, I suspect it'll be the same in government. And so it's going to be critically important for us, Paul, that we the same mindset we've taken to get uh, in the, during the pandemic is the same mindset we'll need coming out is let's get to solutions, let's work together and, and put BC on a strong footing uh, for economic recovery. Thank you. And one of the programs um, uh, was referenced actually to a question from one of our members, um, and, and I'd made a note of it already as a, as a question we had before. Which, which came out and has been revisited, which is the small and medium-sized recovery grant, which I think was uh, less well-subscribed than, than you'd hoped for in the early stages. And obviously it's been expanded and the criteria have been loosened. Do you have any plans for any further changes to the criteria for the program? And do you expand, expect to expand it beyond the March expiration? Yeah, thanks for the, the mention of that program, Paul. Um, and, and first I'll say that that is one of a whole host of initiatives that we've done as a government to support businesses. As you know, there's PSD rebates, there's uh, uh, tax credits for hiring and rehiring. There was 25% um, uh, discounted alcohol price, liquor prices for restaurants and patio licenses. Um, and the list will go on and I won't go on all about it. Uh, the small business grant program is one of those pieces. Uh, we heard from small businesses that uh, the last thing they need is more loans. Uh, they need some cash injection. And so that was why the program was created. Now, the first week uh, of becoming a minister, I met with uh, organizations like Burnaby Trade Association, and all these different organizations. I said, hey, listen, what can we do to make this program more accessible and inclusive so that more businesses can uh, participate? The recommendations came back, back to us. We did everything. We did all of them. Uh, and what we saw was in the first year up to December, we had about 1,500, less than 1,500 applications come in. Just in the last four weeks, we've had over 6,000 applications after the change in the program. Uh, and one of the key changes we've made just recently, and I think your members will appreciate, a lot of businesses, especially ones that were operated by business owners that where English was not their primary language, we, we found and we heard there were some challenges in navigating the application process. And so what we've done now is Instead of uh, the recovery plan, which you need to submit, being done by uh, a handful of um, approved uh, accredited organizations, we've now allowed businesses to go to their own bookkeeper, go to their own accountant, and get uh, them to do the work. And we will pay directly to the accountant or the bookkeeper for doing that work in, in the applications, up to $2,000. And we found that's been a big shift uh, for uh, many businesses who've now applied because now their bookkeeper is doing it and, and we're paying them for the work. And so we're seeing an uptake. We're going to continue to monitor that program. Uh, over 60% of the applications are coming from tourism operators, which is uh, not 30,000 up to 30, that's up to 45,000. And so we're going to monitor to see if that rate grows and we'll have a better sense in, in, in about a month's time uh, where the money will be and, and what we can, you know, then we'll look at other options from there. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. You touched earlier in, in, in your remarks on some of the, um, the reliefs and some of the assistance that was given uh, last year. Um, and I just wanted to touch on a couple of them. And I'll start off with, the, um, uh, with property taxes with, uh, because of a, a, of a cut through the, to, to the school tax component, um, uh, property owners were able to get a 25% reduction in their, uh, in, in their property tax. Um, we have addressed this with um, Minister Robinson's uh, ministry directly, but I just wanted your thoughts on, on what, uh, property owners and business owners might expect for this year in, in, in that specific area. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm glad you said Minister Robinson because this is in her ballywick, and uh, and uh, and she would be disappointed if I make financial announcements at, uh, <laughs> at, 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 play, at play inside my box, as they say, Paul. But yeah. um, I, I'll just say that um, from day one, I think one of the, the 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 things that I think worked best for us here in Canada, not just BC is that there was a close alignment between all levels of government when it came to responses. I mean, I know early on there was just a whole host of programs and they were coming so fast and nobody knew how to navigate them. And your organization played an important role in helping businesses navigate all the op uh, opportunities that were there. Uh, but what we're doing is we're working very closely with the federal government to make sure that our programming aligns with their programming so that we're not tripping over each other and there's alignment. And I know Minister Robinson in her early days as 
uh, as minister has been doing a great job of building relationships with the federal government and now with uh, our new finance minister, Minister Freeland, um, there's a good relationship built so that we can align our programming because we know the support. Like I had, a, I did an interview, Paul, um, with media last week and the reporter said, well, you know, if 98.7% if of all jobs uh, have returned to pre-pandemic levels, well, why are you spending millions of dollars handing them out to businesses? And, and, and the truth is that 98.7% is fantastic. It means the supports we're putting in are, are working, but without those supports, the number would not be there. Uh, over two thirds of businesses are relying on government supports right now. And so we need to be thoughtful um, just as we uh, were in kind of where we're getting to now, we need to be just as thoughtful as we open up to ensure that we can continue to support as many businesses as we can. And, and I know Minister Robinson is committed to that as well. Um, thanks. And without wishing to stay in Minister Robinson's lane, but there is one area that we, we have flagged with her ministry, but it touches a good point that you made about the importance of businesses being able to rehire and hire new people. And that's the, uh, the employer health tax, which... Um, is a, a tax on, on job creation with each new employee potentially costing a business uh, more in uh, EHT payments. And, and we've been advocating for, for some time now for an increase in the exemption, exemption threshold uh, to one and a half million from the current half a million. We've seen other provinces recently, Ontario most recently, increase their thresholds quite significantly in this area. Um, while I know it's a, it's a finance ministry area, it is a job creation area too. And, and I wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, thanks uh, thanks for that, Paul. And uh, as you can imagine during a pandemic, we've got billions of dollars of ass uh, coming from uh, various organizations and business community. And, and Minister Robinson is going through all those pieces um, uh, very diligently. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, your members will know that we uh, the rate we have is one of the lowest in, uh, in Canada. It's uh, tied to Ontario from all the, provinces that have um, uh, this kind of structure. Uh, and, uh, and so we know that supports are gonna be needed. Um, we're gonna have to look at all the uh, asks, so to speak, uh, and, and weigh out what we could do phys phys fiscally and what will have the most impact uh, for supporting uh, our business community. And, and so those conversations are happening already and, uh, and we'll have to wait till the budget to see uh, what Minister Robinson uh, goes with. Good, well, we look forward to that. Um... Uh, I'm just seeing if, if there's some more questions coming through. Um, my colleague is, is curating some of those. Um, before I, I get, get, get into that, I wonder if we could touch on the Launch Online program that you mentioned um, mm -hmm. earlier. We found uh, we, we were able to get some funding and some support for a program which helped businesses improve their online um, uh, presence. Um, and we managed to get, at no cost to the businesses, 40 businesses um, moving uh, either from nowhere to something or, or, or just improving their online offerings, offerings in the areas of, of e-commerce facilities, et cetera. Um, this kind of hands-on programming, is this something that we can expect to see more of? And do you see, what, what future do you see to the Launch Online grant program? Well, um, the program, this uh, program, as well as a digital bootcamp, which we launched late last year, was about giving uh, small businesses and medium-sized businesses the opportunity to, in the, in the boot camp situation, was to just learn about how online world works. Because many businesses always said they want to do it, but just never got a chance to go to it and now have no choice. And so where do we go in the future? I mean, we know innovation is going to be a key uh, for economic recovery. And we know it's going to be critical for our small and medium-sized businesses to be able to have online presence if they uh, if they have their e-commerce set up to be able to have that strong base. And so the launch online program, I was so excited to be able to launch it uh, just a week ago. Um, and we have over 1,200 businesses that have already signed on uh, in, in just over a week, which is phenomenal. Um, and what's really amazing about it is over 40% of all the applications that have come in so far have come from either rural or indigenous communities. Uh, and so what it tells us is that it's not just about Lower Mainland, it's about BC, and it's a, it's a major issue that we need to address. And so my goal will be to focus on this uh, in the coming years, as long as the Premier has me in this role. Uh, I think it's critical for our economy uh, to address productivity, and innovation is going to be the key, uh, the key driving piece in that. So um, I can't speak to future years because we have to go through processes, but uh, I can say that the program response has been huge. 
Um, and uh, and the, the amazing thing about that program, if any of your members are watching, is that even if you've got online presence and you perhaps you did it yourself because you were learning, you can still apply for this program and get a professional company to do the work to uh, upgrade it, to, to put in the, the bells and whistles that your business needs. We have had businesses that um, did this on them by themselves and then realized that they, they didn't really, you know, do a great job or their feedback from their customers wasn't great. And now they're taking advantage of this program to uh, get a professional organization to come in, set it up, help them with some advertisements. Uh, and so I would strongly recommend any of your members uh, that it would be interested to please apply on launchonline.ca. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and for all of these kind of programs, obviously a, a, a massive part of the role we play as, as a, as a, as a mm -hmm. member-based business organization is yep. to make sure our members are aware of these kind of programs that are out there. So um, th thanks for sharing that. And it's good to know as well that it's a program that the programs available, not just for people that are starting, but for people that have made that investment themselves already, um, realize that mm -hmm. maybe they didn't get where they wanted to and are now looking to move forwards because sometimes those programs exclude those kind of people for, for, from yeah. taking part. Yeah, no, we wanted to make it inclusive as possible. And even some not-for-profits um, can apply for that. If you have not-for-profit uh, members, uh, if, you know, as long as they can show that they've had at least $30,000 revenue come in, uh, they can still apply. The 30000 was a threshold that we put in the program, but there are many uh, not-for-profits um, that uh, do bring in revenue uh, and they can uh, certainly take advantage of this. Good, thank you. I've um, got a question here about um, uh, the, 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 in, in your mandate letter, the Premier tasked you with positioning BC as a global exporter of climate solutions by investing in, in, in made in BC technologies. Can, can I ask you to just speak to where you are in terms of your priorities in that area? Um, and and uh, also the government, uh, if, if you like, being a proof of concept leader by using its own procurement processes to, 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 to take a leadership role in, in, in uh, buying green and, and, and sustainable procurement. Yeah, I appreciate that question. And, uh, uh, you know, anyone that's been watching politics, especially in the U.S. and seeing what's happened with the Biden administration and their first week in government, uh, proclaiming that they're going to take a very bold um, movement towards climate change, addressing climate change. That's certainly a signal for the world. Uh, and we're already seeing many, many companies wanting all over the world wanting to shift their finances and their capital to, uh, to businesses and uh, to provinces and jurisdictions where the governments are taking this seriously. And we have a huge benefit in that we already have a very clean energy grid by, by just that alone, we are producing some of the lowest carbon products, resource products, um, our manufacturers are the greenest in the world, our supply chains are green. And so we're gonna see, uh, we're gonna be certainly trying to take advantage of telling that story uh, uh, internationally. I've already been having meetings with uh, uh, counterparts from various countries to tell them about how we can help address their climate change challenges um, with our uh, innovation, with our technology. But it's also within government, as you mentioned, through procurement. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had made changes to our procurement strategy, uh, and we put in a social impact piece uh, where um, uh, the score up to, I think it's up to 10% can go towards um, uh, local producers of whatever it is the government is procuring, uh, gets uh, slanted towards so the social impact piece. So we are looking at from government, how do we support that? Uh, but we have so much opportunity. You know, we have... Um, you know, when you look at food security, for example, it's a top of mind issue. Uh, and uh, we are able to produce now food through Agritech in, in facilities, indoors, vertical growth. And we have huge opportunities uh, here in BC with AI, with AR, VR, with, um, um, uh, you know, clean tech, of course. We've been, you know, we're leaders on clean tech. Uh, and so the list is massive. Uh, and not to mention life scientists, which uh, I know, um, that uh, uh, stem cell is looking forward to getting into their new uh, facility uh, soon. Uh, can't come soon enough, yep. which will be big in Burnaby. Uh, and so, you know, I just see so much opportunity, both uh, internal within BC, within Canada, but also to be able to export not only the cleanest products in the world, but also export um, climate change solutions that are being produced here in BC. And, and, uh, and Paul, uh, not to take too long on this, but we're also going to be launching a strategic investment fund very soon, uh, and I'm excited. It's going to be half a billion dollars, 
It'll be the first of its kind in Canada. Uh, we're modeling it off of uh, Ireland and, and Denmark, which launched these types of funds a long time ago, which will allow government to provide capital, patient capital, to uh, in, in particular to climate change solution companies or clean tech companies, um, and, and also allow the province, the, the, the people, to take benefit by having some sort of equity stake in, in the companies. And uh, that's exciting. I'm looking forward to that launching. And uh, I know that'll be welcome for businesses uh, that are trying to solve some of the climate change challenges that we're facing here. And that's good to hear. As you know, Burnaby for some while has been a, a, a real hub for clean energy and clean tech organizations. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's exciting to hear what, what, what you say there. Um, a couple of other questions I'm just looking at going through. Um, in, in terms of, of, of supports from government to help businesses uh, export, explore international markets and, and, and implement those, those uh, trade solutions that they're looking for. Uh, what, what can businesses um, look for in, uh, in government support going forward? Well, we, uh, of course, we have the Export Navigator program, which has been phenomenal, had huge successes uh, helping businesses uh, navigate uh, international waters and figure out how to position themselves to be able to uh, leverage um, uh, the products that we have here with the rest of the world. Um, uh, certainly, I'm doing lots of work uh, talking to our resource sectors right now about how we can uh, work with them to uh, not only become greener, uh, but also to, to share with the world uh, the opportunities. You know, we have huge opportunities around hydrogen. I know Minister Rolston is looking at, um, uh, in his mandate letter, it uh, is to develop a clean tech hub. Uh, so that we can uh, find ways to uh, leverage that as well. Um, Minister uh, George Chow, who's one of my colleagues uh, in my ministry, uh, focuses on a lot of the, the trade and investment side of uh, the ministry. And we've been uh, doing the early work of ensuring that we're strengthening our relationships with our international trade partners in the same format as we're doing right now. Uh, and it's certainly our hope that the moment Dr. Henry says we can travel, that uh, we will be packing our bags uh, and uh, we'll be looking to our, our partners in, in Korea and in Japan. Uh, we see emerging opportunities in, um, in uh, of course, Singapore, but also Vietnam, uh, and then as well in Europe, in, uh, in, in Ireland, in, uh, in Holland, in, in the UK, uh, and of course the US. But um, one of the things I'll be looking to do in the next short while is, uh, is this strategic investment fund that we're gonna launch is to build relationships with other strategic investment funds all over the world so that when we invest in a company that's a BC company, uh, we are able to take that uh, and share that with other uh, similar minded investment funds so that there's more access to capital. So we're looking at a whole host of initiatives and more to come, uh, I suspect, near the fall. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Now, we've got a question here, just um, uh, not about your ministry necessarily, but about where you're based. And it's a question about the George Massey Tunnel Replacement. Um, yeah. Government has had the business plan for, for a few months now, and, and a lot of businesses are anxiously waiting to know the path forward and the time frame of that path. Yeah, and, uh, and I'll just say that um, living south of the Fraser, um, uh, I have to highlight the investments we've made uh, in both uh, transportation uh, infrastructure as well as transit. Uh, you know, for a long time, we had to pay to get over Portman Bridge. Uh, and the uh, Patella was falling apart and, uh, and, and Alex Fraser was jammed. And now we've got an additional lane on Alex Fraser. We've got people traveling on Portman for free, which means that uh, if, they, uh, if they actually need to go over Patello, they can still go over Patello. Uh, and certainly with COVID, we've seen uh, less numbers. Uh, so let's put a little bit less pressure on, on the Massey crossing, but it's a priority project for us. Uh, the business plan came to the Minister of Transportation uh, late last year uh, and conversations with the federal government have started. Uh, the Prime Minister made a commitment uh, last election in, uh, in Delta actually uh, to be a partner in, um, in that critical piece of infrastructure. And so I know the ministry is starting to engage with the Ministry of Finance in, in, uh, with Canada on what that partnership can look like. Uh, not only that, but also opportunities to extend SkyTrain uh, in both uh, directions. And uh, I think those infrastructures will put us, uh, those projects will put us in a good place here and, and certainly in the lower mainland. Yeah, thank you, thanks. Um, I, I recently wrote a letter in, in I a letter published in, in the Burnaby Now on the subject of the importance of, of, of uh, vaccinations and, and the coverage of, of vaccinations, as well as uh, widespread 
uh, mass uh, rapid testing. And I know that we have those resources in BC. I don't think we've been necessarily using them a great deal lately uh, in recent times, but um, the, the, the rapid testing, we, we certainly have access to. Vaccines, obviously there have been some challenges in getting the, the, the supply. Um, I know this is something which, which we, we discuss in, in the, the, the task force that I'm, uh, that I'm a part of, but um, what, what, are your, what, what, what can you share with us just in terms of the confidence the province has in terms of being ready to go once the vaccine ramps up and, and maybe if there is a role that can be played by the, the rapid testing uh, kits that we seem to have some access to. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we, we do have some rapid testing uh, capacity in the province. Uh, as uh, we've talked in the, in the COVID super committee, as I call it, um, you know, the, the false negatives are high. Uh, the false positives are high, so it's not an you know it's not as effective as as the other testing we we do. But we have used it in situations where we've seen uh, in, in more marginalized communities when we've seen a little bit of outbreaks, uh, you know, like uh, street homeless. We've gone out and tested as many people as we can because we knew we need to get some result right away because we don't know where people are going to go. Um, we had a case in uh, in uh, Surrey at a school where um, uh, one uh, person had come sick. Uh, with the UK uh, variant. Uh, and so the rapid testing was used to test everyone. And then as well, they, we tested obviously the, 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 the longer testing process as well. We're, we've been using it in care homes as well. So we have been using them. The challenge uh, with this kind of testing when, it, when its variables are so high and, and a lot of business uh, uh, members will, will appreciate this as well as the app which uh, I know some people advocate for, but it hasn't been working the way uh, it should be. Certainly, if you look at Ontario and other jurisdictions, if that was the solution, we always like to think technology will solve everything. If that was a solution, Ontario and Quebec wouldn't be having the cases levels that, that they had been having. Uh, and so it's not a solution in itself. And, and you know, a lot of employers also raise concerns that if uh, their employee comes and says, I was, my app tells me I was in touch with somebody that, uh, or in contact with somebody that had COVID, how do I treat that employee? Do, I, do they go home? Do they stay home? How long do they stay home for? Uh, and, and we know the science says, even if you were in the vicinity of somebody, it doesn't mean you have COVID. Uh, it depends on what that interaction looks like. And so there's so much gray area there uh, that uh, is always challenging, but we're gonna continue to look for ways to expand the use of rapid testing. And I know Dr. Henry's our lead on that. When she tells us to move, we will. Um, and as far as vaccination goes, um, you know, uh, it can't come fast enough, you know, that, that light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but it's a very long tunnel. <laughs> and, uh, and so we're, we're hoping that uh, uh, it's starting to scale up again, and we're hoping that it continues to scale. The plan to vaccinate uh, people in BC is the most comprehensive plan I've ever seen, certainly hoping uh, that we never have to use this kind of thing again in our lifetimes. Uh, 160 vaccination sites, we have business leaders from all over the province offering their facilities. We have uh, community leaders offering their facilities. Um, and so uh, the sooner we can get that going, the sooner we can get back to whatever the new normal uh, looks like. And, and another conversation that uh, I've been tasked with uh, is working with um, uh, my counterparts in other provinces, as well as the federal government on how do we ensure that we never get stuck in a situation like this again? You know, uh, how do we ensure that we have the capacity for vaccination? How do we ensure that we have uh, all the PPE systems that we need to, as a country to, uh, to not rely on other jurisdictions? And, and those conversations have been going quite well over the last week. Good, thank you, thanks. And, and it does seem as if um, uh, in order to meet the, 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 the federal vaccination targets, it's gonna be a pretty ramped up uh, a process, isn't it? So, so once you start to get the access, the, we, we need lots of them in lots of different places. Yeah, we've got a system in place. Uh, Dr. Um, Penny, I can't remember her last name, I apologize, uh, from Vancouver Coastal has been hired uh, to, to lead the vaccination program. And uh, it's, just, it's just a matter of, uh, somebody just put in uh, Penny Bellum. Thank you, uh, Joanne, <laughs> for, for putting that in the comment section. Uh, and Dr. Bellum will, uh, is leading the work and uh, it's quite impressive, uh, the mobilization. Uh, plan that they have in place. And again, 160 places and, and having to register um, uh, people and booking appointments for them to come in to be vaccinated in a safe way. It's going to be, there's going to be bumps along the way, no doubt about it. But uh, uh, again, can't come soon enough. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. 
Um, I wanted to touch on, on um, a, a subject which for, for many, many years, we've been a bit of a leader in, in, uh, in advocating the, the importance of childcare and education as a business issue. And the importance of it certainly is very clear now when we look at, uh, at the future of jobs and recovery, childcare and education are key parts of that. We're, we're very grateful that the, 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 to the work the government has done in keeping schools open so that parents can return to work. Um, and on childcare, as I say, we've always felt it's a very clear economic issue. Uh, I would encourage the government to continue that work on ensuring access to childcare spaces for Burnaby families. We've got a great advocate for that with, uh, uh, with, with, Mrs., uh, with uh, MLA uh, Katrina Chen. And, um, and, and we'd, we'd certainly just advocate for that work to be continued. Yeah, and, uh, and I'll just say that uh, a couple of things. When, when the tide comes out, you end up seeing all the challenges that we have in the society uh, in, in, a, in a way that we've never seen it before. Uh, and if you look at the unemployment numbers, uh, uh, the labor force data that's come out, uh, in particular around March and April, you saw a huge decline in women from the workforce. Uh, and, uh, and those were the same times where we'd shut down daycares and shut down schools. Now it can be argued uh, and rightfully that this is a sexism issue uh, that you know overwhelmingly women uh, have been um, uh, are seen as the caretaker and have that responsibility that perhaps should be shared more equally. Um, but the the reality is is that that period shows us right there how critically important that childcare and our education system is for our, our economic. Uh, um, our, our economy. And uh, so I'm so proud of Minister Chen's work. Um, she's, uh, you know, we've invested $2 billion in the last few years alone in childcare. And, uh, and uh, I think it's the right way to go. And I've been having meeting with tech leaders uh, throughout uh, BC and, and, and they're saying this is number one issue. And, uh, and I just wanna give credit to you, uh, Paul, and to your organization, because I think that the pandemic has shown us that there's no separation from social issues and economic issues that all the issues uh, are go hand in hand. If we don't address uh, mental health, if we don't address addiction, if we don't address uh, hard to house uh, homelessness uh, in childcare and housing and healthcare, then our economy won't function uh, at, the, at the capacity that it can. And so we see all of the functions of government being part of an economic recovery uh, and not seeing them in separate uh, lanes. And, and, and certainly leadership from yours uh, organization is, is, is an example of you know, not wanting to separate them, seeing them going hand in hand. Yeah, no, well, thank you for that. It's something that we've had very much at the forefront of our uh, mandate and agenda for, for many, many years and, uh, mm. um, and, and, and a very, very true words spoken there. I've got a question here on, um, has the BC government forecast electrical demand as we turn to more electric vehicles going forward? And, and how uh, are we prepared for the increased demand on our grid? Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, and we have more um, supply than we have the demand, but uh, you know, electrification is gonna be our key for our, uh, to meet our climate change objectives. Uh, and so we know much of our resource sector, that's where the greatest opportunity is to get our, um, uh, our, our targets uh, more aligned to where we think as a province we should be going. And so there'll be a demand, uh, certainly uh, Site C will bring on more energy uh, but we're going to have to look at other renewable energy sources as well. And uh, I know that Minister Rolston, he's got, um, he's got hydro, which is an important player. He's got the hydrogen file, which is also going to be an important piece. And, uh, you know, today I saw the digital super cluster um, announce funding for a project uh, around uh, uh, with ships and, and, and energy storage for ships. And so that's a great pilot project to be able to I see more electrification on our, in our ferry systems, certainly starting with the smaller fleets and then working our way to the larger ones. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, the short answer is yes, we, we model it. Uh, BC Hydro is very much in that business, yeah. uh, only that business. And, uh, but we do see opportunities for other renewables uh, in the mix as well. Thank you. Um, and, and sticking with, a, with a, an energy theme, and, and you mentioned about tax dollars being rooted towards clean energy. Uh, investments this is a question for one of our uh, members um, uh, and the members uh, expressed interest in the mechanism behind that process for example are these decisions made at a government level exclusively or are taxpayers included in this decision making process and how do we ensure we're investing wisely um, I, I'm not sure oh I, I think maybe the person is talking about NBC 
um, but I, I can't, I, I don't know exactly where, what uh, piece that they're asking about, but the um, strategic investment fund, I assume he's talking about, the person is talking about, but if it is, uh, the strategic investment fund, more details will come out soon. Um, both Irish and, 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 the, uh, and Denmark, uh, the models they've got, uh, it's, a, it's a distance from government so that we're not going out there and just picking. Um, and so, you know, I think what's important here is that, you know, often government is seen as a de-risker for new initiatives uh, for projects. And, and what that really means, and let's just say what it is, it means the public takes a risk. Uh, and so I think we should just call it a spade a spade and say government needs to take on more risks so that we can uh, ensure that we have that innovation and that change that we need in society. And, and that's good. I think government can take on that risk. But I think it's also important for government when they take on that risk and we're doing that with public dollars, the public sees some value in that. And so that's why I think the Strategic Investment Fund is going to be great because we get to now invest in BC companies. We'll, we'll have professionals doing it with separation from government. Uh, making decision making, just like Ireland and Denmark have done. And we'll also, as a public, get to see the gains of, uh, of our BC companies along the way. And in a lot of uh, investment, uh, it wants to see quick turnaround. And so a lot of the solutions we have are going to take more time and they need longer term financing. And so this, will, this body will be able to give uh, certainty for, for both. And uh, so I'm looking forward to, to that. Thank you. Um, I think we've got about another eight to 10 minutes left. So um, just a, 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 a couple of questions here um, from, the, from the membership. Uh, as the Minister responsible for innovation, what are your views of innovation? Obviously, it's a positive concept. However, there are a number of examples of negative impacts of some innovations. How will you evaluate investments in innovation and ensure unintended consequences um, are minimized? Uh, an example would be the negative impacts on congestion and transit use of an innovation like Uber which is very good for consumers. Yeah, no, that's great. Great question. And, uh, and certainly uh, as the, the sustainability lens is going to be uh, key. As I said, part of our economic recovery is three pillars, right? It's innovation, it's sustainability and inclusiveness. And it doesn't mean you can do one and not the others. <laughs> uh, we need to move on all three of them at the same time if we, if we think it's um, a meaningful enough uh, agenda to move forward on, and, and we certainly do in government. And so, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Innovation, uh, blindly supporting innovation is not uh, certainly something that our government wants to do. But if innovation leads to uh, us reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, to reach our climate uh, clean BC targets, um, to ensure that Indigenous communities and, and rural communities get a, a chance for economic development, uh, in solving some of the societal challenges that we want to uh, address. Uh, I think that's, that's the kind of innovation I like. And, and so I'm excited about uh, agritech uh, in particular, um, because, you know, I just think there's huge opportunities. You know, I, I think we uh, all should take a moment at some point and pause and think about this crazy time that we're living in. Um, and uh, and I, I recall in, uh, in April and May, the panic over toilet paper but there was also a panic over food. Uh, and so if we want to avoid this and address climate change going forward, how are we going to do that? And, and I think there's a lot of agritech companies exploring those solutions right here in BC. In fact, some of the, the, the leading uh, thinkers on this are actually here. And so that's just one example, but there's going to be a whole host of them. But bottom line, we need to address, uh, we need to ensure that we uh, address productivity in, in our economy. But at the same time, uh, help us in that transition and make sure people are trained in that transition. So it's a long-winded way of saying uh, it's not just blindly supporting all innovation. Um, you know, uh, the, the nuclear bomb was uh, designed and no one is saying that this is the greatest innovation. It, was, it just happened. But we're talking about going in directions that will help us address climate change uh, in particular. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think this may well be the last question. Um, are there particular federal matching opportunities that you're considering to drive further investments in infrastructure or innovation? Yeah, well, I had just had a, we were on a call with uh, Minister um, um, uh, Champagne. Uh, I've uh, had meetings with Mayor, Mayor and Minister Ng. I've had meetings with uh, Minister Jolie and they've got now a BC Western Diversification Office. And so we're gonna engage with them on how can we align our, our programs? How can we align our visions? 
there will be some moments where Canada will want to go in a different direction. But I think the responsible uh, approach to all of this would be to align as much as we can. Uh, certainly, we've been doing that in uh, around the hydrogen strategy that we're developing is looking at the federal government saying, how can we partner? Um, and uh, because we want to leverage those dollars and and, uh, and 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 drive all of, as much money as we can into BC, and so uh, I would urge uh, anyone watching, anytime you talk to one of our federal colleagues, to remind them that uh, BC uh, has got great uh, potential for uh, federal dollars. Um, and one of the biggest ones that uh, we've been advocating to the federal government on is, is the polar icebreaker contract, which is uh, we'll see C-SPAN building the polar icebreaker. Uh, it was scheduled to be with C-SPAN. It was taken back, and and we've been uh, nonstop advocating to the federal government that those dollars need to come uh, back to BC so that our uh, shipping industry can see the benefit. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, well, I think that probably just about wraps it up. We've just gone past uh, past five two, and, and and thanks very much for spending so much time with us and for answering um, all all the questions that came forward. We uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and this is a, a one of the great. Uh, parts of the work that we do as, as, as a Chamber of Commerce, as the Board of Trade here. It's, it's great to have um, political leaders and, and other community leaders come and speak to our members, but it's even better when we have the chance to provide feedback and have some specific mm -hmm. questions answered as well. So thank you for, for indulging us and providing us with that opportunity. And thank you to all of our, uh, our members for, for taking part today as well. And, and, I, and I'm sure everyone uh, was, was uh, really, really enjoyed the discussion that we had today. Um, a couple of more upcoming events tomorrow. Uh, I did mention earlier, it's Chamber of Commerce uh, week this week. Tomorrow we have a virtual members networking mixer. We can't all physically shake hands, but it's one of these uh, mingle rooms where you, you each get a bubble with your avatar in and you can wander around the room and bump into other people's bubbles and, and have chats with them. So it's the nearest thing you can have to a proper in-person chat while doing it virtually. So that's tomorrow at 4.30. Um, on the 24th, we have an information session. So if you're somebody who happens to have joined us today who is not part of our organization and you'd like to find out more about us, 24th of February is your opportunity to do that. A couple of days later on the 26th, we have a, an, a, an online networking breakfast. Um, we, we, we were a little bit concerned about how those networking events would, would fare in the virtual world, but we're getting just as many people showing up for the virtual version as we have for the physical one. So come along on that one on the 26th uh, in the morning. Um, and then on March the 4th, we have a session on how you can um, uh, we, it's a joint session between us and our friends at the Tri-Cities Chamber as we welcome representatives of the Government of Canada for a session on government procurement and how you and your organisation can, uh, can engage on buying and selling with the Government of Canada. Um, so thanks again, Minister Callum. We really appreciated you coming here today. Um, thank you, Jocelyn, on, on behalf of uh, the Port of Vancouver, and thank you for your support for the event. Um, happy Chamber of Commerce Week to everybody. Uh, we really appreciate your support in helping us do the work that, that's so important on behalf of the business community. Um, enjoy the rest of the week and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you.